Today, we're happy to have Shaivra from Princeton speaking about um, Ramanujan conjecture and the density hypothesis. Uh, okay, uh, so thank you very much for the invitation to come and speak here. Uh, well, today I would like to talk about uh, the Ramanujan conjecture and the density hypothesis uh, version of it due to Sanak and uh, Xu. Uh, but I want to begin the talk uh, uh, from a different perspective, uh, try to motivate it from a different point of view. Okay, so uh, I think uh, many people in the audience uh, have seen and are familiar with the uh, arithmetic manifolds. Uh, by this, I mean actually congruence arithmetic manifolds. So these are locally symmetric spaces. Uh, they are uh, of the following form. So you have some, uh, a real Lie group, and you have some maximal compact subgroup of it. And the quotient of the Lie group by its uh, maximal compact subgroup uh, has a structure. It is uh, uh, what is called a symmetric space, and it has a structure of a contractible Riemannian manifold. And you take this symmetric space and you quotient uh, this by a congruence arithmetic subgroup, and, and you get uh, what I refer to as arithmetic manifold. <coughs> And well, uh, here's the most uh, famous example. So you take the group of SL2 with uh, real coefficients, the maximal compact subgroup of it is SO2. And the associate symmetric space uh, to this group is the upper half plane. And for a congruence arithmetic subgroup, you can just take all the matrices with integer coefficients in SL2. Uh, which are mapped to the identity uh, by the modulo Q map. And this uh, arithmetic manifold, uh, what you get from this is uh, what are called Riemannian surfaces or uh, modular curves, depend on whether you are, uh, whether you prefer uh, differential geometry or algebraic geometry. And okay, so this is, I, I think this is well known and I'm, Honestly, curious to know how many people are familiar with the following discrete and finite analog of arithmetic manifolds, uh, which one may call them arithmetic complexes. And the setup look very, very similar, but instead of taking the a real Lie group, you take a periodic Lie group. And again, you K is a maximal compact subgroup of it. And instead of a symmetric space, which is a contractible Riemannian manifold, you will place it with a Boatitz building, which is a contractible polysimplicial complex. And you will place the congruence arithmetic subgroup with the congruence P arithmetic subgroup. So to those of you who have never seen such an object, here is an example to, here's an important example to keep in mind. And again, it looks very similar to the setting of a Riemannian surface. So you take the group SL2, but now with the periodic numbers, the maximal compact subgroup of it is SL2 with the periodic integers. What replaces the upper half plane is now the infinite P plus one regular tree, also known as the Boatitz tree. And well, when choosing the congruence arithmetic subgroup, one need to be a tiny bit careful. You don't just plug in the same, uh, the rings, uh, into SL2, but you take an inner form of SL2. Uh, and you take an inner form such that you, uh, at the infinite place, you have a compact uh, group. I, I don't uh, worry about it. Uh, what's important is that uh, what you get from this construction, so first of all, you get a finite object, you get a finite graph, and these graphs are a, a and known, there, there are what are called Ramanujan graphs, and they were constructed by uh, Lubotsky, Philips, and Sarnak in the late 80s. Okay, so uh, why should you care about uh, these objects, these arithmetic complexes, if you really like arithmetic manifolds? Okay, so I'll try to motivate uh, 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 this, try to motivate these arithmetic complexes to, from a number theoretical point of view. So as I think, uh, Many people know automorphic forms. And by the way, this is a talk about automorphic forms and automorphic representations. So 
think it's well known that automorphic forms are uh, essentially functions living on arithmetic manifolds. And from this perspective, uh, arithmetic complexes are the natural domain on which modular forms and their generalization to higher dimensions lives on. And by generalization to higher dimension, I mean uh, there is a theory developed by uh, Benedict Gross in, the, in, in a paper called Algebraic Modular Forms. And this is what I refer to modular, as modular forms. And using, so uh, one also gets from studying arithmetic complexes is that certain natural uh, and important operators coming from number theory, uh, I, I refer to the famous Hecke operators, have a natural and geometric interpretation when you study uh, what they mean on arithmetic complexes. So they are exactly the adjacency operators on these complexes, which are essentially just graphs. And using this dictionary between the adjacency operators of the arithmetic complexes and the Hecke operators on these arithmetic complexes, on the modular forms which are function on these arithmetic complexes, uh, what you get is that the Ramanujan conjecture, which I will describe what it is in a few slides, translate to a statement about the spectrum of these arithmetic complexes. And so what does this mean in the concrete example I mentioned from before? So for instance, the Ramanujan graphs that I uh, showed you earlier, the reason they are called Ramanujan is precisely because the modular forms which lives on them, which are actually the uh, eigenvectors of the adjacency operator of this graph. And they're also, uh, uh, they are also related to classical modular forms of level 2q and weight 2, uh, satisfy the conclusion of the Ramanujan conjecture. This is the origin of the name Ramanujan in Ramanujan graphs. Uh, one, can, one can say something even uh, broader. Uh, so, so it is, so it is true that most, by, by most one should be a bit careful, but most of the cases for which we know that the Ramanujan conjecture is true uh, are actually is for automorphic forms which are actually algebraic modular forms. And I will, I will explain what this means in a minute. And uh, by most, I exclude some very interesting cases like weight one classical modular forms as was studied by Delin and Ser, and the recent breakthrough of the 10 authors paper. So excluding those aside, uh, we see that arithmetic complexes and algebraic modular forms uh, depict some uh, natural boundary of our understanding. And to prove that something outside of that boundary is Ramanujan is very uh, rare and it's uh, not very easy. Okay, so this, this is motivation uh, coming from the theory of uh, number theory. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, Ramanujan conjecture, uh, again, I, I will, this is just the motivation. I, I will define the Ramanujan conjecture shortly, but the Ramanujan conjecture uh, gives you all sorts of uh, nice uh, spectral properties for the arithmetics complexes I mentioned. Uh, so uh, it gives you excellent, expansion properties and excellent geometric properties for these complexes, such as the an optimal almost diameter and a cutoff phenomena. And these properties are very useful in applications to the theory of expander graphs, in which uh, Ramanujan graphs are known to be the best expanders uh, uh, one can construct explicitly today. And a uh, high dimensional expander theory and also for the theory of quantum computations. And one can give a separate talk about these applications. And, and in fact, last year I gave a talk about one specific application uh, to, of the Ramanujan conjecture to the notion of golden gates in quantum computation. Uh, today I want to focus more on the number theoretical uh, side of the story. So I'm going to take this application as black box. I won't explain it. Uh, and I want to get it. and. Uh, from the first line, you see that, well, the Ramanujan conjecture, if it is true, it will give me these applications. 
uh, our story gets uh, a bit complicated because the Ramanujan conjecture when stated naively, it's, it's not true for most arithmetic complexes. So this is a problem. Uh, uh, fortunately, one does not really need the Ramanujan conjecture in order to get what we want. One can instead replace it with a density hypothesis version of it, which was suggested by uh, Sarnak and Su in the 90s, which on the one hand give you the wanted application, and on the other hand is expected to be true even when the Ramanujan conjecture uh, is not true. And so the plan of this talk is to uh, first uh, explain the Ramanujan conjecture uh, and it's a generalization to higher dimension. Then I want to explain what is the Sarnak Su density hypothesis uh, for families of automorphic forms. Uh, in preparation for the last part of the talk, I, I then want to uh, describe the foundation in the theory of automorphic representation namely the classification of automorphic representations of the general linear groups, which was done by Langlands and Moglans was Roger, and also the work of, the recent work of Arthur on classical groups. And finally, I'm going to use these results in order to describe a, a proof strategy to the Sarnak suit density hypothesis using the very deep and, and heavy machinery coming from the Langlands program uh, in order to prove the conjecture for uh, families of algebraic modular forms. Okay. Okay, so let me begin uh, at the beginning. So the Ramanujan conjecture was, uh, it appears in, uh, in the paper of, uh, uh, in the paper from 1916 uh, by Ramanujan titled the uh, uh, on certain arithmetical functions. Uh, in it, uh, Ramanujan study is his famous uh, tau function, uh, which nowadays carries his name. And the tau function is defined uh, as an infinite series, uh, as the following infinite series by uh, opening up the following infinite product. Uh, Ramanujan calculated the first few values of the tau function and raised two fundamental conjecture about this function. So first of all, he conjectured that this function is multiplicative and that it satisfied the second order recursion formula uh, for powers of the fixed prime. And this first conjecture was proven shortly after by Mordell using uh, what we call today Hecke operators. And the second conjecture, uh, which is what uh, I will refer to as the, as the Ramanujan conjecture, give uh, the specific upper bound on the values of the tau function at prime uh, numbers. And this conjecture uh, was proven uh, several years afterwards by Delin. So this is the statement, uh, the most elementary statement of the Ramanujan conjecture I could, I could have write. Uh, Next, I want to, uh, so the Ramanujan conjecture as stated today is, it's, it's, it's stated uh, in the modern terminology, which is, seems very far from the original conjecture. And I want to kind of explain the, uh, in bullet points, uh, some, uh, some part on the evolution of this conjecture. So very briefly, okay, so the first part, uh, as I think uh, most of you uh, should know, the, the Ramanujan conjecture is part of the theory of modular uh, forms. So, and, and the link goes as follows. So you can look at the infinite product from before and replace Q with E to the two pi I Z where Z is a complex number in the upper half plane. And what you get is a holomorphic function in Z, a very famous one called the discriminant function. It's a very important function in the theory. Uh, which is actually a, a special case of a hecke cast modular form. In fact, it's the only hecke cast modular form of full level SL2Z and of weight 12. I won't define what this means in a minute because next slide I would just like to talk in modern terminology, not in classical modular form terminology. But in any case, uh, so this function is a special case of a hecke cast modular form and it is, it's Hecke eigenvalues are precisely 
the value of the tau function. And so you can reinterpret the Ramanujan conjecture as saying that, as saying, uh, as giving uh, specific bounds on the Hecke eigenvalues of this specific Hecke cusp modular form. Uh, Peterson later uh, came and generalized the original Ramanujan conjecture to all Hecke cusp modular forms for any congruent subgroups gamma and for any even weight. So this is uh, how you state it for any Hecke cusp modular form F. Uh, and then uh, Eichler uh, was uh, the first to show the connection between the Ramanujan conjecture and uh, algebraic geometry over finite fields by showing that the ramanujan peterson conjecture for weight two modular forms reduces to the Riemann hypothesis for, for curves over finite fields. And Delin, as I mentioned before, uh, proved the full ramanujan peterson conjecture and he did it in two steps. Uh, the first step, uh, following Eichler, he reduces the ramanujan peterson conjecture, the full ramanujan peterson conjecture, to the Riemann hypothesis for varieties over finite fields, also known as the Vail conjectures. And, and the second step is, of course, is a famous proof of the Vail conjectures. And, but I, I don't want to go into the proof of the ramanujan peterson conjecture. Instead, I want to go in a, in a different direction, which is the reformulation done by Satake of the ramanujan peterson conjecture in an automorphic representation theoretical language for the group GL2. So instead of uh, stating, uh, so the ramanujan peterson conjecture is for classical modular forms, and Satake stated for uh, one it called modular representations, and even more general for any automorphic representation, specifically for the group uh, GL2. But what this formulation, uh, a distinct advantage that this formulation has is that it is easy to generalize the conjecture to other higher rank groups, uh, which lead us to the modern uh, formulation of the generalized Ramanujan conjecture. So this is one of the central uh, open problem in the theory of automorphic representations. And I will, in, in a second, I'm going to uh, explain what each of the, uh, each of the words under, uh, underlined uh, means. Uh, so the statement says that any, well, unitary is a mild technical condition. I'm requiring that the central character is unitary. Let's not dwell on it. But what's important is that the conjecture says that if you're cuspid on an automorphic representation, then you're tempered locally everywhere. And this is a conjecture for the general linear group. Oh, and in case I, I haven't mentioned, uh, for simplicity in this talk, I'm only working over the field of rational numbers. Even though you can state it more generally, I'll just stick to the rational numbers. Okay, so what each of these uh, words mean. So uh, what does an automorphic representation? So first recall that uh, the field of rational numbers uh, contains, it sits inside uh, many, uh, local uh, local fields like the field of real numbers and the field of uh, periodic numbers for any prime p. In each of them, the, the rational number is a dense subring or subfield. Uh, but what you can do is you can take the restricted product of all of the periodic completions of Q. Uh, you get what is called the ring of Adels, and this is a huge ambient locally compact ring in which the the rational number sits diagonally as a discrete subgroup, a discrete subring uh, of finite covolume. And a similar statement, uh, thanks to the theory of arithmetic groups, holds also to the group GLN with rational coefficients as sitting inside the Adeli group GLNA. Uh, Modulus some issue with the center. Again, let's not dwell on the center. And this enables you to define an, a natural action. So first of all, you can uh, consider the Hilbert space of square integrable functions on the quotient of the Adeli group modulo the rational group. And the Adeli group acts on it. And actually this, so it acts on it from the right. And, and this gives this Hilbert space a structure of a 
unitary representation of the adelic group. This is a highly reducible representation. And we say that an irreducible representation of the adelic group is called automorphic if it occurs in the spectral decomposition of this highly reducible representation. And one need to be a tiny bit- Do you need to take care of the center? Sorry? Do you care of the center? So I, I, I went, I, I, the, in the bracket I mentioned uh, modulus the center. So I, okay. if I All really right. want, so there should be like an, a, sub, a superscript one saying that I, I kill the center in GLN1. Hey, yes, thank you. So, uh, so any automorphic, so I'm, I'm only considering automorphic representations with a unitary central character. Ah, okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, this is, so uh, one need to be a, a tiny bit careful in defining a curl, uh, at least when it comes to, because the, this representation has a discrete part and a spectral part, uh, I don't want to uh, give the precise definition, I just want to give you an idea of what does automorphic means. Okay, the, the second notion is uh, caspidality. So, uh, to define the notion of cuspidality, I need to recall that there are uh, certain special subgroups uh, uh, which are called Levy subgroups. So in the case of GLN, these are just the block diagonal subgroups. So you can actually identify them with the product of GLN i, uh, where the sum of n i is equal to n. So all the n i are smaller or equal than n. And there is a procedure uh, uh, which one may call the automorphic parabolic induction, which takes an automorphic representation of M and bring you back several, not, maybe not just one, but several automorphic representation of GLM. And we say that an automorphic representation is cuspidal if uh, it does not occur, does not come from such a parabolic induction procedure. So this, uh, uh, so the, the mantra is uh, cuspid or automorphic representation are the building blocks and the way you build things is using parabolic induction. And finally, the notion of temperedness. So uh, an automorphic representation pi of GLN, uh, you can write it as a, a tensor product of local representations. And, and so pi p is a representation of the group GLN over the, Piadic field QP. And to such a local representation, you can associate an, an, an analytic invariant. It's denoted sigma of pi p. It's the rate of decay of matrix coefficient of pi p. And this analytic invariant is very important in the application. Uh, the bigger sigma is, the worse uh, situation you are. Or to put it in other words, the closer the rate of the decay is to the number two, uh, the better. Uh, this is, this is the, the property that you want in many applications. And we say that pi p is tempered when sigma of pi p is equal to two. So the conjecture is saying that if you're the building blocks, you're, if you're cuspidal, then you're excellent for application. And what's important to note is that this conjecture is uh, open for any n greater or equal to two, even in the case of n equal to two. Uh, on the other hand, as I mentioned, uh, the Lean proved the ramanujan peterson conjecture. So what does the Lean um, uh, theorem means in the model terminology? So the Lean's theorem actually translates to the case of n equal two of the following special case of the generalized Ramanujan conjecture, which one might call the generalized ramanujan peterson conjecture. So you add two more uh, restrictions. So you consider only cuspid automorphic representation of GLN, which are self-dual and cohomological. And so here are the definition of self-dual and cohomological. Uh, if you, I mean, if you've seen them for the first time, the only thing you need to remember is that uh, together they are what uh, generalize the notion of being a holomorphic modular form of weight two to higher dimensions. Uh, the important thing is that uh, this, uh, this special case of the general Ramanujan conjecture is in fact a theorem. And this theorem, uh, uh, the, the proof of this theorem uh, owes to the, uh, to the work of a, a great number of uh, great mathematicians, 
started with Eichler, uh, Berlin, as I mentioned, proved the case of N equal to two, Shimura, Langlands, Kotwitz, Klozel, Harris, Taylor, Nego, Shin, and this is, also, this is only a partial list. And uh, I want to say one remark for the experts, and it's also related to the motivation I, I mentioned earlier, uh, which is that I'm going to explain uh, uh, the work of uh, James Arthur in a minute uh, and, some of, uh, and some of its extension, but uh, what's important to, uh, what, what, what I want to remark is that this, the representation for which the generalized Ramanujan, uh, the generalized Ramanujan Peterson conjecture apply to are precisely, uh, there are, uh, there, there are uh, automorphic representation which comes from classical definite groups. Definite means compact at infinity. And they come from such automorphic representation using what Arthur refers to as weak Langlands functorial transfer. In other words, the conjecture or the elements in the conjecture, the automorphic representation in the conjecture actually comes from algebraic modular forms. So this is why what we know about the Ramanujan conjecture, which is this generalized Ramanujan Peterson theorem is uh, in fact related very much to the theory of algebraic modular forms. Okay, um, and another thing to keep in mind is that, so I mentioned the general Ramanujan conjecture for the, I uh, stated it for the general linear group, but in fact, Satake reformulation works for any connected reductive group, not just for the general linear group. And you can state the same conjecture. Cuspid automorphic means, uh, means tempered locally everywhere for any such G. And I'll call this the naive Ramanujan conjecture. Well, it's naive because it's, it, it, I mean, as in this full generality, it, it's not true. And it's not very hard to come up with counterexample. In fact, take any globally anisotropic group that you like, meaning take any group that doesn't have a Levy subgroup defined over the rational numbers. Uh, for this group, the trivial representation is uh, cuspidal uh, automatically, but uh, this representation is highly non-tempered. Uh, a much more deeper result, uh, proved by Kurokawa and Hauke Tetsky Shapiro, says that the naive Ramanujan conjecture is also false for the next nicest class of groups after the general linear groups, namely the split and the quasi-split classical groups. And again, a remark for the experts today. So the, the way that Kurikawa and Hauke Tetsky Shapiro proved this theorem was using the theory of uh, the, the, the theta correspondence. But today we actually have a, a better understanding of which, uh, at least for classical groups, which cuspid automorphic representation violates it. And those are precisely the ones, well, you, uh, the, the one that violates are actually cuspid automorphic representations. They are not really cuspidal because after you map them into an automorphic representation of GLN, they cease to be cuspidal. So, uh, okay, so, so this is just a, a tiny remark. The, the, but, but we see that the naive Ramanujan conjecture is false. And as I mentioned in the introduction, we would like uh, I mean, we, we would have wanted to be true for the application. Uh, and the uh, main idea in the formulation of the density, the sound suit density hypothesis is it's, it's the fact that while the Ramanujan conjecture is a statement about all cuspid or automorphic representations there are for a specific group, the application don't really care about all of them. They want that, uh, so the, the, the main point is that one bad automorphic representation can't hurt you, or a few number of bad automorphic representation that violates the Ramanujan conjecture can't hurt you. So this is, uh, this is uh, the idea behind the density, the density hypothesis. Okay, so I want now to state uh, what the density hypothesis says, and then I will explain its connection with the Ramanujan conjecture. So now just the formulation, how to state the density hypothesis. So first of all, uh, let's, uh, F should be a family of automorphic representation of GLN or some other group. Um, 
f of q will be the subset of members in f whose analytic conductor is bounded by q. Analytic conductor is a, it's a way, it's, a, it's an assignment of a, a, a real positive number to each automorphic representation, which order the automorphic representation. So it gives them a size. And so f of q is the analytic, the, those of analytic conductor at most q. f q of sigma are those of analytic conductor at most q and rate of decay of matrix coefficient bounded from below by sigma. So this set is the set of bad guys. These are the set of automorphic representations in our family that violates the Ramanujan conjecture by at least sigma. And this is what we want to bound. Uh, another uh, important uh, piece of uh, uh, data that we need to add to this mix is we want to specify how, uh, what exactly are we counting? So you should add some weight function and this, and this weight function should tell you whether or not you're uh, counting representations, in which case you just put the weight one, or maybe you're counting uh, packets, or are you counting uh, automorphic forms, in which case you should give a weight for any representation, the dimension of the, the fixed vector under some uh, congruent subgroup. So the weight function depending on uh, your specific application. And uh, given this data, here's uh, how uh, you can uh, state the sarnak density hypothesis. So the statement says that uh, the weight or the number of uh, automorphic representation of conductor at most Q of, whose rate is uh, at least sigma is bounded by the number of those of conductor at most Q to the power of two over sigma plus some, uh, any small epsilon that you would like. And maybe there is some a const, a leading constant which depends on epsilon, but not on Q and on or sigma. Okay, so this is the Sarnak Sue density hypothesis. And now let me mention, uh, let me say a few remarks about it. Uh, the most important remark I, I, I won't say about it because, uh, well, I, 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 it, it won't be written, but maybe I'll say it in words. So here's a, a few uh, remarks. So first of all, I mentioned in the previous slide the notion of a family, but I didn't define what an automorphic family is. Uh, nor will I. Uh, there, there are several notions of uh, families and uh, I, I refer the, the, the interested listener to the paper of uh, Sarnak, Shin and Templier in which they study these notions. They study several such notions. And in this work, I refer to what they called harmonic families. So let me give you an example instead of the definition. Uh, Taking all the self-dual automorphic representation of GLN is a family taking, giving perhaps some uh, specified condition at one uh, prime, like saying, taking all the cohomological self-dual automorphic representation is also a family, taking all those that are unramified at the number two is also another family. So you can add some local conditions uh, for uh, the set of all automorphic representation. And this is, this is the, the type of families to keep in mind. Another remark I want to mention is that uh, there is an easy way to remember the Sarnak Sue density hypothesis, which is that it is a simple interpolation in the exponent of the two trivial bounds. So you take the, so in the case where uh, sigma is infinity, then this set FQ of sigma should be comprised of only the finite dimensional representation of G, which is a finite set independent of Q, so the exponent should be zero. And on the other ex extreme, you can take sigma to be two, in which case there is no condition. And so the exponent should be one. And then you just interpolate between those two bounds. Um, the epsilon factor appearing there is a sort of a safety valve. So, so as to not, uh, so if I would remove it, maybe the conjecture would break down because of some uh, log factor missing. So here I'm just taking extra precautions and not a log factor by putting some uh, 
epsilon to the power of, perhaps you can uh, state a stronger density hypothesis. Uh, so, and so here's the connection between the density hypothesis to the Ramanujan conjecture. So uh, if your family is all those uh, cuspidal uh, representation of GLN, then the Ramanujan conjecture just says that this set FQ of sigma is empty for any sigma bigger than two. So for this specific family, the generalized Ramanujan conjecture implies the Sarnaxu density hypothesis. But this strategy of proving the density hypothesis it obviously doesn't work as we've seen for other groups because of the failure of the naive Ramanujan conjecture. It might not even work for other families that doesn't only contain cuspidal representation. Uh, or uh, uh, to quote uh, uh, Peter, uh, the density conjectures are replacement of the Ramanujan conjectures, not because we don't know how to prove the Ramanujan conjectures, but because the Ramanujan conjectures he formulated naively are false as we've seen but the density conjectures should always be. So this is the idea behind the, the density hypothesis. Uh, let me just throw uh, one remark, uh, but this is, uh, I can't really elaborate this, this uh, more on this. So uh, uh, the Ramanujan conjecture, you can uh, interpret it as a local version of the Riemann hypothesis. And from this perspective, the Sarnaxu density hypothesis are sort of a local analog of the uh, bombieri vinograd of density hypothesis for the zeros on the L function. Okay, but, but I don't want to get into uh, this. Okay. Sorry, I forgot, Wh which weight function do you take in the formulation? Oh, that's a great point. And I will, I'm going to leave it unanswered. So the idea is, let me just go back to the previous slide. The idea is you get to pick the family. Uh, the, the, the analytic conductor is pretty much forced on you. And so is the rate of decay of metric coefficient according to this uh, definition, but you also get to pick the weight function. So a family is a set with a weight function. And then you can specify whether this data satisfy the Sarnaxu density hypothesis. So maybe for different weight functions, the Sarnaxu density hypothesis will give different results. And I'm, I'm, I'm just giving a definition. And it all depends on the applications. And this is a, this is a crucial point. So I, I will get back to this uh, remark that you made at the very end, but uh, thank you for asking this question. Okay. so. Uh, I want to uh, describe a possible strategy in proving a, a density, uh, this density hypothesis. But to do this, I need to first uh, lay down some, uh, to recall some of the fundamental theorems in the theory of automorphic representations. Specifically the classification of automorphic representation of the general linear groups and the classical groups. Okay, so A of N will denote the set of uh, automorphic representations of GLN. Uh, uh, there are important subsets of this set. So for instance, the discrete automorphic representation of GLN, the cuspidal automorphic representation of GLN. I denote them as follows. And the general uh, idea of the classification, which is part of the philosophy of a cusp form uh, due to Arichandra, uh, and this idea was a uh, developed uh, considerably by uh, Langlands in the theory of automorphic representation, uh, says that uh, we would like to classify all the automorphic representations in terms of the cuspidal automorphic representation um, of a, perhaps uh, of smaller dimension. And before stating the theorem, let me add just one piece of notation. So for a positive integer n, a, a shape of it denoted by theta is just a set of ordered pairs such that the sum of the product on the pairs is equal to n. And there is an associated Levy subgroup of the specific shape, which is you take the, so it's the block diagonal matrix uh, and the blocks are uh, M i copies of the GL GLNI. And now the theorem uh, which builds on uh, uh, Langland's work on Eisenstein series, in which he uh, 
reduces the classification of all the automorphic representation to the discrete part. And this theorem was uh, completed by the work of uh, Moglan and Swansburger, uh, which uh, classified the discrete part using the cuspidal part, says that uh, for any shape theta of n, you have some map, i theta, from the product of the cuspidal representation uh, uh, of the dimension ni appearing in theta to the, all the automorphic representation of gln, such that the following, uh, the following holds. So for any automorphic representation of gln, it has a unique shape there is a unique shape theta associated to it and unique cuspidal automorphic representation data such that pi is the image of the, this uh, theta map uh, with respect to this cuspidal automorphic data. Do you require this ni are different? No. Uh -huh. No. This, this uh, it, it may be, so if, if you're familiar with the work of Arthur, it, there is such a risk a requirement there to describe the, uh, the discrete part of the spectrum and, it, and I, I won't even, uh, I won't mention it for lack of time, but no, no restriction. Okay, so um, uh, what you also get from this theorem is first of all, just by looking at the shape, you can determine whether the, uh, the representation is discrete or cuspidal and you can determine the Satake parameters of the Hecke eigenvalues of the automorphic representation in terms of the shape and the appropriate Satake parameters of the cuspidal building blocks. Okay, and, and next we go to the, to the uh, uh, fundamental work, uh, the recent work of uh, James Alter in which he classify the automorphic representation of classical groups. So here our setting is that G is now a quasi-split orthogonal symplectic group. Uh, A of G is the set of automorphic, automorphic representation of G and little i of G is uh, the standard representation or the standard embedding of the dual group of G. It's a, it's a mapping of a complex, complex groups. And here the idea uh, which borrows from, the, from uh, the Langlands program and specifically from Langlands functoriality, uh, which is due to, as far as I know, this is an idea due to Arthur, which says, let's classify the automorphic represent representation of G in terms of the automorphic representations of GLN. And this is uh, what uh, Arthur proved. So the proof uh, relies on uh, uh, many important results in the area of the language program, for instance, the fundamental lemma proven by Nego, the stabilization of the trace formula done by Arthur and the twisted trace formula by Moglan and Swansburger. And it says that there is some map from the automorphic representation of G to the automorphic representation of GLN. Uh, Arthur calls this the weak functoriality map. Uh, on the Satake parameter uh, aspect, it's very easy to describe how the map works. So the Satake parameters of the image of the map is just taking the Satake parameters of the original representation and map it using the standard uh, representation on the dual group side. Uh, I don't have time to really describe the, uh, uh, the full uh, uh, technical aspect of uh, Arthur's theorems, there are many theorems here, uh, but let me just say, uh, just mention that the fibers of these maps are given uh, by local and global A packets, and they are determined by endoscopic character relations. Maybe if I'll have time, I, I'll mention something about this. And the image of this map is comprised, which is comprised of self-dual representation are also determined according to multiplicity formulas. Uh, this who is uh, in Arthur's work. And finally, just to show you that this map is, uh, it's in a way it's dense in the set of all self-dual automorphic representation. So every self-dual cuspid automorphic representation of GLN appears in the image of, such, of, a, of this uh, map for a unique such G. This is uh, what authors call a seed theorem. So, and there are some uh, generalization, there are uh, some work in uh, generalizing this result of Arthur to 
uh, inner forms of classical groups. And this uh, group of four authors worked on uh, unitary groups and Taibi worked on uh, something uh, I personally will uh, require, which is definite groups. So I'm going to assume that uh, they are all successful in their, in their work. And I'm going to assume that uh, the, the completion of this uh, line of work of Arthur for other classical groups, not just for quad split. Uh, okay, so, uh, so now we have the foundation of the theory of automorphic representation. I, I want to describe to, to you a strategy of how to prove the density hypothesis for uh, certain families. And the idea is that I do not want to prove the density hypothesis for one family at a time. I want to prove it for a, a huge group of family in one uh, clean swoop. And to do it, I, I need to introduce some notation. So uh, I'll, I'll, call, I'll, I'll introduce the notion of an automorphic genus, which is basically a collection of families. And, and this is simply just a subset of automorphic representation of GLN for all possible n, just a subset. And, uh, and this is related to the question I was asked. It's, it's a very important uh, issue. It should come equipped with some weight function. I won't specify the weight function. It's, uh, you'll see it in the last slide. Okay, so uh, now I'm going to uh, define some uh, properties. So the genus satisfy property L at least for Langlands, if for any shape theta and for any cuspidal uh, automorphic representation of the associated dimension in the shape, and if phi is the, the shape theta map with the cuspidal data pi i, and then if pi belongs to the genus, then it's cuspidal data also belongs to the genus. So this is the first property. Uh, the second, uh, we said that the genus satisfies the uh, property R named for Ramanujan if any cuspidal automorphic representation of the genus satisfies the Ramanujan conjecture. It is tempered locally everywhere. The third property, uh, we say that G satisfies property W uh, named for a uh, vial is that there is some function alpha on the inter on positive integer numbers such that the following holds for any positive integer n and any shape theta of n. So first of all, the number of dimension n uh, of conductor at most q automorphic representation in our genus grows like q to the power of alpha n. The second is that the number of, uh, uh, of shape theta automorphic representation of conductor at most q inside our genus grows like q to the, to the the sum of uh, alpha and i. And finally, that this fundamental inequality holds for any shape and uh, for any shape theta of n. And the last property, uh, property S uh, for Sarnak says that this genus satisfy the density hypothesis in all dimensions. These are the four, the four properties. Okay, so uh, once I've defined these four properties, it's pretty straightforward to see that the, first, the claim that the first three properties imply the, the fourth one. And this is uh, quite straightforward. So you just plug in the Langlands property and the Ramanujan property and the description of the Satake parameters under the uh, parabolic, automorphic parabolic induction. And what you get is that uh, what determines the rate of decay of matrix coefficient uh, of any representation in your genus is only its shape. You don't really care about its cuspidal data. So it is determined, uh, so the, the rate of decay is given by this simple formula. And what this formula gives you is it enables you to write the set of all automorphic representation in your genus uh, whose rate is bigger than sigma is just a, a finite union of shapes of your, the automorphic representation in your genus of a specific shape theta satisfying this condition. And the claim, uh, the, the claim just uh, follows by this observation combining with uh, the vile property. 
The second claim I want to mention is that the, the, the fact that your genus has property S actually implies that many, so any subfamily of your genus, which is large enough. So F could be G of N for any N, or it could be just a subset of it, which let's say it's half of G of N for any conductor Q, or it could be considerably even uh, smaller than that. So for any large enough subfamily, you get the Sarnatsu density hypothesis for it. Uh, and this is just a one line proof. Okay, so let's see a few examples. Let's start with the most. Excuse me, in, in the property W, do you, do you need an asymptotic or an upper bound? Okay, so I'll, I'll get, uh, let me. Okay, so it's very weak asymptotic. So when I say this, there is some epsilon here, what I really mean is that this quant the, the quantity on the left is for any epsilon that you'll give me. So, okay, so, so you pick your n. Now, for any epsilon bigger than zero, the quantity on the left is smaller or equal to the property of the right up to some constant depending on epsilon, independent on Q. And I'm also, you are also allowed to add at the exponent plus epsilon. So uh, this, okay, so I, I, I said in, in, a, in, a, in, another, in a, another way, this means this thing in both directions. It's a very weak, it's not, it's not a tight asymptotic. I'm, I'm, I'm requiring uh, something uh, much weaker than that. So there could be an epsilon the exponent in both directions. It should be smaller than Q to the alpha n plus epsilon and bigger than Q to the alpha n minus epsilon. Thank you. Okay, so here are just the, the simplest example. So the first example, you can just take the universal automorphic genus, take everything. Property L obviously holds. Property R is equivalent to the generalized Ramanujan conjecture. Property W, I don't state it because in order to even check if it's true or not, I need to specify a weight function, which I haven't yet. So, uh, I'm, just, I'm just talking about property L and R for uh, this example. Here's another example. Take uh, what the, I, I call the universal modular genus. So all those who are, all the automorphic representation which are self-dual and cohomological. Again, property L holds because self-duality is preserved and so is cohomological if you define it properly. Property R is equivalent to the generalized ramanujan peterson conjecture, which is a theorem. So now also property R holds for this genus. Again, I haven't specified you the weight function, so you can check property W. Okay, this was a warm up. Here's an example, a proper example. So now you take the genus of all the automorphic representations of classical groups which are compact at infinity. Let's also throw in the extra condition to make my life easier, that at infinity you have only the trivial factor, the trivial representation. And you map all these representation, of course, to GLN by the weak functoriality. So you get a, a set in the automorphic, uh, the universal automorphic genus. And the weight function that I pick specifically now is you just take the size of the fiber under the weak functoriality map. So this is your counting representation, say it right away. And okay, so now, so let's see. Uh, okay, so now the claims I'm about to say it's there are simple consequences of the deep work of James Arthur. So from the work of uh, James Arthur combined with uh, the work of Taibi for, he, we extended the work of uh, uh, the classification of art, the, mul the multiplicity formula of Arthur to definite classical groups. So uh, from the two works, you get that uh, this genus satisfy property L. 
Uh, actually, what they prove is that this, uh, the members in this genus are uh, the automorphic representation, which are self-dual, this follows from Arthur's work, and cohomological, this is, uh, follows from Taibi work. It's, easy, it's, it's even easier if you add the condition that you're, tre you're this condition really makes the cohomological property very easy to verify. In any case, uh, the, the genus is actually, this specific uh, set is actually contained in the universal uh, modular genus, and because of the validity of the generalized Romanujan Peterson conjecture property, R also holds. What about property W? Okay, so uh, here, uh, using the fact that the size of the fibers, so what is the size of a fiber? Uh, well, it's just the product of the local A packets at the, un, at, at the ramified primes of pi. And each local A packet is sizes of, it depends only on N, not on the conductor at all. So uh, what you get, you can actually give an upper bound on size of the fibers as a power of the logarithmic of the conductor. So this is just taking a, it's, it's, it's an even a, a much relaxed upper bound, which is all we need for the application. And finally, by counting the automorphic representation in GLN of a specific, of a specific shape, again, and I'm counting automorphic representation, you get uh, quite easily the vial property. Combining everything. So, by the way, this is the strategy. This is uh, what I'm, this is the purpose of the talk. And combining uh, all of this together, you get that the genus satisfies the Sarnak property. And which gives you that any large enough subfamily in it, for instance, you can only consider for specific dimension N and say only the automorphic representations which come from orthogonal groups. This is a large enough uh, subfamily and this will satisfy the Sarnak suit density hypothesis. Okay, so I have uh, just a few minutes. Uh, so, so what I'm describing is uh, something I've been working on for uh, the past two years. And, and okay, so just to recap, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are many uh, applications, interesting application of the sonic suit density hypothesis. Uh, elementary application, you don't really need the language of tomorphic representation to appreciate how nice these applications are. However, I've, I, I have been cheating a bit and I was asked a question which is spot on. Uh, and, the, and the problem in, in there is no, it's not, it's not a problem in what I, in the strategy I suggested, but it's a problem in order to get the application. So for most of the applications, the weight function should really count automorphic forms. I shouldn't just count automorphic representations should count automorphic forms. Uh, so this does not affect the Langlands property. It does not affect the Ramanujan property. It affects the Weil property. So I should be more careful in how I define the weight function and, and how I count things. And so uh, again, this is a, 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 walking, a walk in progress. And the, what I am dealing with is that I need extra data to, to know about uh, the work of uh, Arthur and Arthur's uh, A packets. And I need to know the following data on uh, representation sitting in these A packets. I need to know the, so I, I call the, there is some, uh, I call this data, the dimension data of an automorphic representation. So I need to know how the, the dimension of the space of invariant vector under principal congruence compact subgroup grows. And, and there are several questions uh, which one may ask. For instance, does this data depends at all on the members on the pack on inside the A packet or is it uniform for the entire A packet? I don't really need uh, equality. I, I, could, I can make do with saying that it's 
for members in the same A packet, this dimension data is essentially bounded. This is sufficient for the application. I don't really need equality and I, I don't require equality. Uh, and I'm saying this being uh, aware that this is a stronger condition than asking for depth preservation in uh, the local Langlands uh, correspondence. So I'm not asking for full on preservation. I'm just asking to be bounded. Uh, actually, if I'm, uh, if I'm even more uh, in line with the Langlands philosophy and the Langlands uh, correspondence, I can, I can pose the following question, which I'm, I'm hoping someone will know the answer to. Uh, so the global Langlands correspondence says that the, the automorphic representation should correspond to certain Arthur parameters. Uh, and, and my question is, what is the analog of this dimension data on the automorphic side in the Galois side, in the parameter side? Is there some natural uh, such a sequence of numbers uh, such that the, the dimension data of the automorphic representation is essentially it's, uh, close to uh, the mysterious data on the Galois side. And by the way, before someone will, uh, will, will tell me that, well, the global Anglans correspondence in all of its uh, glory is not yet established and it's hard to state it because of the hypothetical uh, global Langlands group. This is not a problem that uh, I need to worry about because I'm in, I'm in a more restricted case in which I don't need the full global Langlands group. I have, so the, the, the automorphic representation I'm dealing with correspond to Galois representation, global Galois representation, or if you uh, want a, a, a representation of the global vibe group. I don't, I'm, I, I don't have any issue with the fact that there is no hypothetical explicit uh, global Langlands group. And I'm, I'm, I can ask this question and I, and I, yeah, so I think I'll stop here and I thank you very much for your attention. All right, let's all unmute and clap and thanks Shai for a great talk.